Good afternoon, and welcome to this week's webinar presented by Beresford Booth. My name is Per Oscarson, and I'm a member of the estate planning and probate group here at the firm. Uh, my topic today is mental health advanced directives in Washington State. These are a relatively, relatively new idea. They've been available in the state of Washington for about 22 or 23 years. Uh, some of the other things that you might be aware of, for example, POLST, that's the uh, Physician orders for life-sustaining treatment have been around for a while as well, and other things such as powers of attorney you may be familiar with, they've been around much, even much longer. So first, what is a mental health advanced directive? It's a written document that a person can, can make, it's not required, but it, they can make to declare their instructions or preferences or to appoint another person to make mental health treatment decisions for them, or it can be both. Uh, as long as it's consistent with uh, RCW, that's Revised Code of Washington, Chapter 71.32. The purpose of it is to allow a person who has capacity to control the decisions relating to their behavioral health care, and that has kind of a broad definition to it, uh, when they may not have the capacity to make those decisions or to give informed consent to treatment. Uh, the state of Washington, the legislature, has recognized that there are certain types of behavioral disorders that can cause a person to have capacity at some point and lose capacity, but to, to fluctuate back and forth between the two. And so the purpose of this is to allow someone, while they do have capacity, to provide those kind of instructions or preferences on the treatment that they want to have when they don't have that ability anymore. So let's, let's go to what is incapacitated for purposes of this statute. So it's, it's really one of four things. The first three, you can see it's basically unable to understand the nature, character, and anticipated results of the proposed treatment or alternatives, the inability to understand the serious possible risks, uh, complications, and anticipated benefits from treatments and alternatives, including not treating it at all. A third, being unable to communicate their understanding uh, or their treatment decisions. And then finally, if they are already subject to a guardianship. So you notice that this focuses on mental incapacity. It does not focus at all on any kind of physical incapacity that might prevent someone from being able, for example, to move around or do some of the other, uh, some of the other actions of, of daily living. This is really focused on the, on the mental. So what kind of things can be included in a directive? And this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, so as, as I started out with preferences and instructions for behavioral health, the treatment, um, since there is a wide variety of uh, types of treatment that could be available, uh, they can express their preferences for the types that they would want to have used if, if it becomes necessary. Uh, the person can also consent to specific types of behavioral health treatment, or they can refuse to consent to specific types of behavioral health treatment. Uh, they, in such a document, they can also consent to admission to and retention in a behavioral health treatment facility for up to 14 days. Again, it's limited to 14 days. They can provide a description of situations that may cause them to experience a behavioral health crisis. Uh, there may be certain triggers, uh, whether they're environmental or uh, out in public, that, that could cause something like this and they can at least describe those situations that may cause the need for getting behavioral health treatment. Uh, they can provide suggested alternative responses that either may supplement or be in place of a direct behavioral health treatment. Again, this is something that uh, the healthcare professionals will be able to provide uh, examples, very good examples, and uh, allow the, the person who is granting or executing this advanced directive to provide that they want a certain type of response and maybe not some of the others. Again, in, as you see in G, it allows for the appointment of an agent under, a power of, under the power of attorney statute to make behavioral health treatment decisions on behalf of the appointee.
appointing person. This would require that the advanced directive, if it's going to include such a thing, that it also comply with the uh, power of attorney statute in Washington, that's RCW chapter 11.125. It also allows the individual to nominate a guardian or limited guardian for consideration by the court if a guardianship proceeding is begun. What it can't do, and again, this is also not an exhaustive list, but what it cannot do, it cannot obligate a healthcare provider or a healthcare facility to pay the costs associated with the treatment. It cannot obligate any healthcare provider or healthcare facility to be responsible for any non-treatment physical care of the person or their personal affairs outside the scope of services the facility normally provides. Um, so for example, if there's need for uh, assistance maybe with uh, financial matters, for example, or, or maybe other healthcare matters that are not uh, mental health care matters, it would not, uh, a lot, the directive may not direct any kind of uh, obligation on the part of the healthcare, the mental health care providers to do anything in those areas. Also, it cannot supersede the provisions of any will or the provisions that govern administration of an estate when there is no will. Uh, those things are governed uh, in the latter category, are governed by state law that provides for, for example, how property is to be distributed if, if someone dies without a will. So the mental health advance directive cannot control that in any way. So what are the elements of an advance directive? They're very similar to what you would see uh, for a power of attorney, although there are a couple of differences. One, one that's not different is it needs to be in writing. This makes a great deal of sense because you've got something that instead of uh, some witness who heard something may have misheard, so having it in writing is required. It requires language that clearly indicates that the person intends to create a directive. This is a little bit, a little bit different from powers of attorney, but um, it also is make, intended to make it clear that it is to be a mental health advanced directive. Similar to a power of attorney, it needs to be dated and signed by the person or by another person in their presence and in their direction if they're unable to sign on their own behalf. Now, they may be unable to sign on their own behalf, maybe for a physical reason, not a mental health reason. Um, this, this D is a little bit unusual, I think, because they have to designate whether they want to be able to revoke the directive during a period of incapacity or if they do not want to have that ability. Uh, it seems to me that, that uh, having the ability to revoke if they're incapacitated kind of destroys the purpose of the advanced directive in the first place, because if they're incapacitated and can revoke their advanced directive, again, there's a good chance that they're preferences and instructions won't, can't be followed because they have now directed that, that the directive be revoked. And so we may be back to the same position that that person might have been in had they never had an advanced directive in the first place. And then again, like with, with powers of attorney, it must be acknowledged, the, the signature must be acknowledged before a notary public or witnessed by at least two eligible witnesses. And two eligible witnesses, there is a, a statute that specifically describes that. Uh, again, just like with powers of attorney, there are restrictions on who may serve as witnesses in, those, in this situation. Uh, usually uh, not someone who is a healthcare provider or not someone who, may, who could benefit if the, uh, if the individual is either incapacitated or later dies. And with that, I have reached the end of this webinar. Uh, I'd like to let you know that there will not be a webinar next Thursday, July 4th, because we will be celebrating the holiday. Uh, however, I'd invite you to take a look at our news and insights section on our firm website, where you can find uh, recordings of webinars that we have done on various topics uh, in the last few years, and also blog postings on various topics. So if you have any questions, you see my contact information there on the screen, and I wish you a great day and a great holiday. Thank you.